Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. About a million still without power in Florida as rescue teams search for those stranded in flood water. Hurricane Ian is a Category 1 hurricane again and heading toward Charleston, South Carolina. The FDA withholding autopsy results of people who died after getting COVID-19 vaccines. The agency says they can't give it out, but not everyone agrees. The Biden administration awards contracts to a group to help illegal immigrants fight deportation, and the organization has ties to George Soros' Open Society Foundation. Candidates for a key Ohio Senate race continue to debate about debates. They haven't fully agreed on where and when they will debate each other. We are starting to see more and more of what Hurricane Ian left behind, a trail of destruction in southwest Florida. Millions were left in the dark, thousands were trapped in their homes. Now rescue crews are working tirelessly to save people in flooded areas. According to local media, at least 23 people are confirmed dead. That number is expected to rise. Here's entities Jeremy Sandberg with more on the hurricane's wake. Ruined homes. Boats and marinas smashed to pieces and collapsed sections of bridges. This was the scene in parts of Florida Thursday after Hurricane Ian passed through the state. Major flooding from storm surge submerged entire neighborhoods. The causeway to Sanibel Island was left in ruins. In Fort Myers, where the hurricane made landfall, people in one neighborhood were seen canoeing past scattered debris and torn apart trees. Many that chose to shelter in place were trapped in their homes. Some say next time they will heed evacuation warnings. 12 foot storm surge, that's what I got. Others say they lost everything and feel lucky to be alive. But I literally watched my house disappear. Governor Ron DeSantis says first responders, service technicians, and Army Corps engineers are working hard to ensure people are safe and have what they need and to get essential utilities back online. We have uh, thousands and thousands of people on the ground uh, working to restore power, uh, opening the roads, bringing in food and water, and restoring communications. More than 2.6 million homes and businesses in Florida were without power on Thursday. Although there have been some reports of casualties, the death toll is not yet certain. In terms of confirmed, uh, that will be made apparent over the coming days. President Biden has approved Florida's disaster declaration, making federal resources available to impacted areas. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Florida Power and Light tweeted that more than 50% of people had their power restored this morning, although that still leaves about a million in the dark. And the National Hurricane Center says Ian is back at Category 1 strength over the Atlantic on the other side of Florida. But it's not a typical hurricane anymore. It's more like a hurricane tropical storm hybrid. This means the high winds are spread out in a larger area, potentially causing more damage as well as it heads back towards land. It's now heading towards South Carolina. Life-threatening flooding, storm surge, and strong winds are all possible. Hundreds of miles of coastline from Georgia to North Carolina are under hurricane warning. It's forecast to hit near the low-lying Charleston area in South Carolina this afternoon. And in the aftermath of Hurricane Ian, an NFL game will go on as planned in Tampa, Florida. It's between the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Kansas City Chiefs. The game will be this Sunday night at the Bucks' home stadium, Raymond James Stadium. This comes after the teams assess damage caused by the storm. The Bucks spent most of this week in the Miami area to avoid direct contact with Hurricane Ian. The game will be a highly anticipated primetime matchup featuring quarterbacks Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes. The Bucks said, quote, We are also very thankful that the Tampa Bay area was spared the most damaging consequences of this powerful storm. If the Bucks and Chiefs had not been able to play in Tampa, the NFL said the game would have been switched to Minneapolis, Minnesota. From hurricanes to COVID, the FDA is not releasing autopsy results of people who died after getting COVID-19 vaccines. The administration says they can't release the data. The Epoch Times submitted a Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, request to the FDA for all autopsy reports submitted to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System after COVID-19 vaccination. Reports are lodged with the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System when a person experiences an adverse event or a health issue after receiving a vaccine.
The FDA and other agencies are tasked with investigating the reports. The FDA declined to release autopsy reports based on federal regulations, which bar the release of personnel, medical, and similar files, the disclosure of which constitutes a clearly unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. But a drug safety advocate who's on an FDA advisory committee told the Epoch Times that the reports could be released with personal information blacked out, saying the personal information could easily be redacted without losing the potential learnings from the autopsy. She added that people make the choice to submit autopsy results to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System and that if someone submits their experience to VAERS, they want and expect to have it investigated by the FDA. The FDA responded, saying that deaths following COVID-19 vaccination are rare. They say around 16,000 reports of death following COVID-19 vaccination have been reported, while over 600 million doses have been administered. The FDA didn't say whether they would ever release the autopsy results. The Epic Times has appealed the denial of the FOIA request. In other news, the Biden administration quietly issues an update to its student loan forgiveness plan. It's scaling back eligibility as six states say the program is illegal. As of Thursday, borrowers who have federal student loans that are owned by private entities and not by the U.S. Department of Education will no longer qualify for the relief program. Previously, the administration said those borrowers would get up to $10,000 or $20,000 in loan forgiveness as long as the debt was consolidated into the federal direct loan program. According to NPR, more than 4 million student loan borrowers have privately held loans through the Federal Family Education Loan Program. The drastic update comes as a group of six GOP attorneys general filed a lawsuit against Biden and the U.S. Education Secretary to block the loan forgiveness program. More on the Biden administration, it has awarded contracts to an advocacy group linked to billionaire George Soros. It was to help illegal immigrants fight deportation from the U.S. Here are the details. According to government records, the Justice Department awarded six contracts worth $41 million to the Acacia Center for Justice. This is for them to provide legal services for illegal immigrants fighting deportation beginning September 1st. The Acacia Center for Justice is a Washington-based nonprofit created through a collaboration between the Vera Institute of Justice and the Capital Area Immigrants Rights Coalition. The Vera Institute of Justice has received millions in funding from George Soros' Open Society Foundation. In June, the Supreme Court ruled 5-4 to four that the Biden administration has the authority to end the Trump-era Remain in Mexico policy. Following the ruling, Vera issued a statement applauding the court's decision. The Capital Area Immigrants' Rights Coalition runs a program which, according to its website, quote, helps detained immigrants learn to understand the immigration court and deportation process. On its website, the Acacia Center for Justice says its mission is to, quote, expand on Vera's work over the past 20 years in providing legal support and representation to immigrants facing deportation through the development, coordination, and management of national networks of legal services providers serving immigrants across the country. Acacia also says its goals are, quote, to support immigrant legal services and defense networks to provide exceptional legal services to immigrants and to advocate for the expansion of these programs and the infrastructure critical to guaranteeing immigrants access to justice, fairness, and freedom. Over in Ohio, the two U.S. Senate candidates have agreed to debate each other, but the two campaigns continue to debate about which ones to attend. Here are the details. The debate over debates continues between Ohio U.S. Senate candidates Democrat Tim Ryan and Republican J.D. Vance. So far, the two candidates agree to two debates. The first will take the stage on October 10th in Cleveland in a forum hosted by WJW Channel 8, and the other one will take place on October 17th in Youngstown, coordinated by WFMJ-TV. But other than those two, the candidates are deadlocked over the form and timing of additional debates. Ryan's campaign said he committed to two other debates, one planned for October 4th in Hamilton and the other one on October 12th in Akron. The Ohio Debate Commission proposed the October 12th form. Vance's campaign declined, citing partisanship concerns. According to Fox News, the executive director of the Ohio Debate Commission, Jill miller Zimmon, is a Democrat who has a lengthy record of anti-Republican rhetoric and activism. The Ohio Debate Commission says it was created in 2018 as a nonpartisan organization. 
Vance's campaign manager told Fox News, quote, Tim Ryan and his team are only interested in debating if they're confident they can rig the system with partisan Democrat activists setting the rules. We have zero interest in joining a debate overseen by a former Democrat candidate for office and board member of Planned Parenthood, who has repeatedly smeared Republicans on our social media. Both campaigns have not ruled out additional debates. Ryan and Vance are vying for the seat currently held by Republican Senator Rob Portman, who is not seeking re-election. Ryan is currently a congressman, while Vance is a political newcomer with the endorsement of former President Trump. As of September 27th, the Cook Political Report and Sabato's crystal ball called the race lean Republican, while inside elections race it as likely Republican. We turn now to foreign influence on the U.S. I wanted to learn more about strategies being used to undermine U.S. sovereignty, so I spoke with a former CIA officer who is an expert on Chinese espionage. Please welcome retired senior intelligence officer Nicholas F. Timiatis. He's also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Thank you for your time today, Nicholas. Thank you. In light of Meta removing Russian and Chinese influence networks, can you explain how these countries attempt to influence the political landscape in the U.S.? Well, it, it, there's a multitude of ways. I mean, China has actually several organizations, several agencies from the United Front Work Department, Ministry of State Security, even the People's Liberation Army, all which have responsibilities globally for covert influence of foreign countries. So. There's there's ways of actual recruitment of individuals to conduct this all the way through for, false media advertising, through social media um, campaigns that reach out to millions. So it, it's actually quite a well orchestrated and well thought out um, and executed capability, particularly against the United States. So you mentioned social media. What do Americans need to be on the lookout for? Well, that's. Um, you know, the, the campaigns for any social media campaigns, and, and China is no exception in this way, that uh, a particular slant or bias towards one type of activity, China works a lot now, far more aggressively in dividing, attempting to divide the United States. Uh, uh, race baiting is a tactic that we've seen starting to evolve from China in the United States. And this goes back to the uh, to the uh, riots in 2020. So. Um, you know, aggressive campaigns on this part. What what typically happens, and you're seen by the tens of thousands on Twitter, uh, where the Twitter finds them out, or in this case now Meta finding them out, and will take them down. So you can question how effective some of these are because they don't have time to build up a massive, um, you know, a massive following before they're taken down. So you typically look for echo chambers. You look for that type of race-based politics that China's trying to divide and conquer in the United States. Let's take up this topic of race baiting that you mentioned. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the CCP uses tactics based on race to divide America. It's clear the CCP manipulates many topics to claim the U.S. is deeply rooted in racism, which Pompeo says is not true. Can you explain more about this? Sure. Uh, I mean, in some senses, China has claimed this forever. Um, you know, lots of countries have. Iran has. You know, Russia has. Lots of countries have made this claim for some time. Some time. They typically make it outside the United States. Uh, they typically China's typically made it throughout Asia that the U.S. is a racist country, uh, and and you know it's not true. I mean, like we have racism in in the United States, like any place, but systemic racism, no. And if you want to take a look at racism anywhere. So those who are throwing stones, in this case, China, is probably one of the more racist places you'll find on the planet. Um, just ask any Tibetan or any person from uh, uh, Xinjiang, any Uyghur from Xinjiang. And the minorities are treated horribly in China as a matter of government policy. And the United States, we have our issues with racism, but, um, but and, and they're exploiting that. The difference is, as of late, is that they're exploiting that in the United States. They're pushing media campaigns in the United States. There were a lot of accusations and research done in them supporting groups in the Black Lives Matter movement and things like that just to push issues of racism in the United States. So it's, it's again, I say it's, a, um, it's the first time we've seen a lot of attacks in the U.S. And it's a, a, a concept of divide and conquer internally. It's interesting how you draw similarities between China and Iran. Nicholas Eftimiadis, retired senior intelligence officer, pleasure speaking with you today. 
Thank you. Uh, pleasure to have been here. Coming up, a judge sides with former President Trump's legal team over dealing with documents seized from Trump's Florida residence. We have that and more just after this break. An update on the property seized from former President Trump's Florida estate. A judge rules that Trump doesn't have to say whether the government's list is accurate. An FBI official gave the court an updated list on Monday, adhering to an order from the special master. But the special master also wanted Trump to file a response and say if the list was accurate or if it omitted any items. Trump lawyers opposed the request. They noted that the order appointing the special master didn't mention a declaration from Trump. But government officials supported the request. They said the special master couldn't begin reviewing the materials until he knows the list is accurate. A U.S. district judge sided with Trump. This leaves open the possibility of disputing the inventory in the future. The documents in question don't include those with classified markings, which Trump's team and the special master are blocked from viewing. Now to the House committee investigating January 6th. Ginny Thomas, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, told the committee that she has not influenced her husband's judicial decisions. In her opening statement to the panel, Thomas said it's laughable for anyone who knows her husband to think she could influence his jurisprudence. Political activists have been urging lawmakers to impeach Justice Thomas because of his wife's actions following the 2020 presidential election. A petition called Impeach Clarence Thomas says that Ginny Thomas, quote, was actively urging the White House to overturn election results. They say that leaves her husband with conflicts of interest. News media publicized text messages from after the 2020 election that show she did discuss claims of election fraud. Thomas said in her opening statement that her post-election activities were, quote, minimal. She testified that she did not speak with her husband about any of the legal challenges to the 2020 election. She also said she was, quote, not involved with those challenges in any way. A former U.S. Army major was indicted on Thursday for attempting to hand over American soldiers' medical information to Russia. In the past, the major claimed to be the first openly transgender officer in the military. Jamie Lee Henry and wife Anna Gabrielian are facing charges of conspiracy and wrongful disclosure of individual health information. According to the Justice Department, starting August, the pair conspired to give health information of specific patients to a person they believed was working on behalf of the Russian government. Henry works as a doctor at Fort Bragg and is accused of providing an agent with information on five patients at the facility. Gabriellian works at a medical institution in Baltimore. She is accused of providing information about the spouse of a person who works in the Office of Naval Intelligence. And another case of espionage-related charges, a former National Security Agent employee was arrested Wednesday. According to the U.S. Justice Department, he's also accused of trying to sell U.S. secrets to an undercover FBI agent who he believed was a representative of a foreign government. The Colorado man worked as an information systems security designer for less than a month. He left in early July, citing a situation with his family and reportedly began corresponding with the undercover agent weeks later. He made his first appearance in court yesterday. Convictions under the Espionage Act can carry sentences of up to life in prison or a potential death sentence. Two former eBay executives are also in jail. They were found guilty in a cyber-stalking campaign that targeted a couple with an online newsletter that was critical of eBay. The e-commerce company's former senior director of safety and security was sentenced to 57 months in prison, and its former director of global resiliency was given two years in prison. The judge also ordered fines of $40,000 and $20,000, respectively. In total, seven former eBay employees have pleaded guilty to charges in the case. They became frustrated with the online newsletter e-commerce bites written by a Massachusetts couple. In August 2019, the eBay group hatched a scheme to terrorize them. Authorities portrayed the security director as the mastermind and said he directed employees to hide eBay's involvement. His lawyers said their client faced, quote, intense, relentless pressure from executives to do something about the newsletter. Over to a tragedy in Philadelphia, police are searching for five shooters who ambushed a group of teens outside a high school, killing a 14-year-old and wounding four others after a football game. 
The group of teens was walking away from an athletic field at Roxborough High School shortly after 4.30 p.m. Tuesday. Philadelphia Police Captain Jason Smith said they believe the murdered 14-year-old wasn't the intended target. Smith said the five shooters sat in a parked SUV until the teens rounded a corner. Then they got out and began firing. One of the shooters chased a 17-year-old victim down the street, striking him in the leg and arm. The shooter then stood over the teen and tried to empty his gun, but either ran out of bullets or the gun jammed. Smith said the 17-year-old does not attend Roxborough High and is not on the football team with the other victims. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And coming up, the U.S. trying to court Pacific countries away from Beijing. The latest developments after the U.S. pledges to spend big dollars there. And why is Falun Gong painted differently in China than it is overseas? A look at Beijing's propaganda history could hold the answer. That and more after the break. As Americans, it seems like other people have been telling us what to do, how to live, and how to think. But that's not how we founded the greatest nation on earth. During times of powerlessness, we found power. And we found power through taking action. Through action, we find solutions. And through solutions, we find freedom. The supply shortage has made it harder than ever to keep your shooting skills sharp at the range. Introducing Strikeman, the laser firearm training system that allows you to practice your shooting skills at home without wasting a dime on ammo. Using our laser cartridge, target, phone mount, and award-winning phone app, become a proficient shooter in under two weeks. Create training templates with firearm drills and get live feedback with progress tracking on your shot accuracy and shot times. Beat personal records and compete with friends and family to crown the best shooter in the group. Put the power back in your hands with Strikeman. Communism is evil. Oh, come on. Listen, if you're as tired of the censorship as I am, I've actually got good news for you. Check out EpicTV.com. It's a brand new censorship-free video platform where you can find not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great programs, and honest movies that bring you the news without all the spin and the fake narratives. So, I'll see you there. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. Cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American Carson Graves? Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. Welcome back. Anti-submarine drills off the east coast of the Korean Peninsula today. The U.S., Japan, and South Korea are getting together to improve response capability against North Korean submarine threats. This is the first time the three countries have conducted such drills since 2017. Each country will search for, identify, and track submarines and exchange related information for this exercise. A week ago, South Korea's National Security Office briefed their president about signs of North Korean provocations, including the possibility of a submarine-launched ballistic missile. North Korea launched short-range ballistic missiles three times over the past five days. The latest launch came hours after U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris toured the demilitarized zone separating North and South Korea. The U.S. is competing for influence in the Pacific region, now racing against Beijing and its inroads there. But what's included in that renewed U.S. engagement? Pledges to spend big money plus meetings and meals with high-level U.S. officials. Here are the highlights. The U.S. and leaders from a dozen Pacific nations agreed on a declaration of partnership. The news comes from America's top diplomat, Antony Blinken. That's after reports that the Solomon Islands won't sign the declaration. The U.S. is hosting a summit for heads of state from a dozen Pacific countries, like Fiji, the Solomon Islands, and Tonga. These countries occupy a key strategic region in the Pacific, and Beijing has been making inroads there in recent years. In April, Beijing signed a security pact with the Solomon Islands. 
It put the West on high alert amid concerns that the deal could lead to a Chinese military base just a thousand miles off Australia's shores. Now the U.S. is re-engaging the region. Blinken announced over four million in funding for a project aimed to better people's livelihoods there. This summit is the latest effort on the part of this administration to hear directly from you about your priorities, your ideas, your hopes for the future of the region and the world, and especially how we can work together to try to achieve them. He said he hopes the nations will come away with a message that the U.S. shares their vision and that only by working together can they tackle the biggest challenges of our time. From combating the climate crisis and health emergencies to promoting economic opportunity to preserving a free and open Indo-Pacific where every nation, no matter how big, no matter how small, has the right to choose its own path. The Pacific leaders also met House Speaker Nancy Pelosi on Thursday. Their day wrapped up with a dinner at the White House hosted by President Biden. Now we address a question from our viewers. One asked, why is Falun Gong painted differently in China than it is overseas? A short answer would be Beijing's propaganda and censorship. In the U.S. and other Western countries, support for the practice abounds. Over the past two decades, thousands of Falun Gong practitioners have been imprisoned and tortured and murdered by the CCP. Forced organ harvesting is one of the most terrible crimes that I think I've ever encountered. We are on your side. Freedom House stands in solidarity today with Falun Gong practitioners and all those persecuted by the CCP. But in China, the regime's attitude towards Falun Gong is the complete opposite. The contrast traces back to the Chinese Communist Party's decades-long propaganda campaign against the practice. For those who may not know, what is Falun Gong? It's an ancient spiritual meditation system based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. The practice became very popular in China in the 90s. At the time, about one out of every 13 Chinese people were practicing it. But the regime launched a nationwide persecution against the practice in 1999. Millions have been detained and tortured since. At least 4,000 have been killed, although the real death toll could be far higher. For the Chinese regime, its struggle against Falun Gong fits into a pattern in its history. Ever since the regime took power in 1949, it has launched a massive violent crackdown on a segment of society about every 10 years. The violent movements stroke fear and consolidate the party's power and control over its people. In the 1950s, the regime cracked down on religion. Over three million religious believers were persecuted, some of them killed. In the 1960s, the regime persecuted cultural and intellectual elites. Intellectuals were classified as the worst enemies of the people. In the 70s, the Cultural Revolution tore apart China's traditional culture. It also took the lives of half a million people. In the 80s, the regime massacred unarmed students asking for democracy, later addressing them as mobs. And in the 90s, it was Falun Gong. But the regime's campaign against the spiritual meditation didn't work out as expected. Then party leader Jiang Zemin vowed to wipe out the practice in three months. But two years later, Beijing's campaign was losing its steam. Many Chinese people saw Falun Gong as posing no threat and believed the regime went too hard. According to the U.S.-based Falun Dafa Information Center, to turn the tide against Falun Gong, the regime stepped up its propaganda game. In 2001, five people allegedly set themselves on fire in China's Tiananmen Square. Beijing claims they were Falun Gong practitioners. And under China's state-controlled media, no rebuttal could be heard from Falun Gong. Authorities were arresting and throwing people into jail nationwide for practicing their spiritual beliefs. At the time, Beijing's propaganda machine went all out. The story was broadcast on TV, radio, newspapers, billboards, comic books, posters, movies, TV series, and even elementary school textbooks. It turned many people's attitude against Falun Gong. But some were quick to point out the holes in the story. The regime said a self-immolator died from immolation. But surveillance footage showed she collapsed after being hit by a man. 
In addition, a Washington Post reporter went to her hometown, and people told him none ever saw her practice Falun Gong. Another clip is also sparking questions. This man's body is visibly burnt, but the plastic bottle with gasoline between his legs wasn't even scorched. Due to China's information blockade, even after 21 years, there are still many people in China who don't know the truth about the event. The Chinese Communist Party smear campaign against Falun Gong is still going on. Coming up, a missile strike hits a car convoy in Ukraine, killing and injuring dozens of civilians. And Russian President Putin is set to host a ceremony in Moscow marking the annexation of 15% of Ukraine. More shortly here on NTD News Today. Missiles hit a car market in the southern Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia today. It hit a convoy of civilian vehicles, leaving bloodied bodies strewn across the ground. At least 23 people were killed and 28 wounded in the attack. Local officials blamed it on Russia. The convoy was preparing to leave Ukrainian territory to visit relatives and deliver supplies in an area controlled by Russia. That's according to witnesses and Ukrainian officials. The head of the explosive disposal unit of the local police department said the market was hit by three S-300 missiles. Bodies lay on the ground or still in vehicles at the scene as police and emergency workers arrived. Vehicles were packed with the occupants' belongings, blankets, and suitcases. A missile had left a crater in the ground near two lines of vehicles. The impact peppered the cars and vans with shrapnel and left windows blown out. The Justice Department has changed a Russian billionaire acu- has charged a Russian billionaire accused of violating sanctions imposed on Russia after it invaded Ukraine. The billionaire Oleg Deripaska is the founder of aluminum giant Rusal. The Department of Justice said Deripaska violated sanctions by using the U.S. financial system to maintain three luxury properties. They say he employed a woman to buy a California music studio on his behalf in 2019 and that he also violated sanctions by having his girlfriend travel to the U.S. from Russia to give birth to his children in 2020 and again this year. Three women in connection to the billionaire were also charged. Attorney General Merrick Garland said the charges show that the DOJ is working to hold accountable those who break our laws and threaten our national security. The Pentagon is forming a new command in Germany to help arm and train the Ukrainian military. The idea is to provide a faster and more effective means of drilling Ukrainian forces on how to use equipment supplied by the U.S. and European allies. The planned headquarters in Wiesbaden, Germany, would put it close to many of the training areas already used by U.S. and Western countries. It will also help coordinate the logistics involving the more than 40 countries who are supplying military assistance to Ukraine. Since the beginning of Russia's invasion in late February, the U.S. has committed more than $16 billion in security assistance to Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin is set to host a... a, is set to host a Kremlin ceremony today, annexing four regions of Ukraine. But his Ukrainian counterpart said Putin would have to be stopped for Russia to avoid the most damaging consequences of the war. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Friday will begin formally annexing parts of Ukraine. Moscow's Red Square was closed to the public ahead of the ceremony, where banners read Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, Kherson, Russia. Moscow plans to annex those four Ukrainian regions, 15% of the country's total area, or the size of Hungary or Portugal. But just how Russia would mark the annexation was unclear. The Kremlin did not say whether Putin would attend the Red Square concert as he did a similar event in 2014 after Russia proclaimed annexed Ukraine's Crimea region. Spokesman Dmitry Peskov said Putin would, however, make a speech inside the Kremlin. The annexation was ordered after so-called referendums took place in the Russia-controlled regions, which Kiev and the West have decried as illegitimate shams. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky warned Russians that the worst of the damage was yet to come. The price that one person in Russia wants to continue this war will be that the entire Russian society will be left without a normal economy, without a decent life, and without respect for any human values. It can still be stopped. United Nations Chief Secretary General Antonio Guterres delivered his own rebuke on Thursday. It is a dangerous escalation. 
It has no place in the modern world. It must not be accepted. Zelensky will meet with his defense and security chiefs for an emergency meeting on Friday, promising a strong response to the annexations. President Vladimir Putin, speaking at a meeting of Russia's Security Council on Thursday, said all mistakes made during a partial military mobilization to reinforce Russia's military operation in Ukraine should be corrected. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Thursday for the first time acknowledged publicly that his military mobilization had not gone smoothly. In an address, Putin said mistakes had been made in a call-up to reinforce Russia's flagging military operations in Ukraine and said they should be corrected. Many questions arise during this mobilization. Mistakes need to be corrected and they cannot be made in the future. This is about those citizens who qualify for deferment. For example, fathers who have many children or people suffering from chronic diseases or those who can't be drafted because of their senior age. It is necessary to investigate each case like this separately. If the mistake has been made, I repeat that it should be corrected and return home those who had been drafted unreasonably. Russia's announcement on September 21st of its first partial military mobilization since World War II prompted thousands of men to flee the country to avoid the draft and provoked widespread public expressions of discontent, including complaints about enlistment officers sending call-up papers to clearly ineligible men. Some 2,000 people have also been arrested at unsanctioned anti-war protests in over 30 towns and cities. Putin said those who had military experience and training in required specialties should be called up first. Yesterday, an American was elected to head the UN's telecommunications agency. That's after two superpowers, the U.S. and Russia, competed for the role. American Doreen Bogdan Martin will head the UN's telecoms agency, which sets guideposts for radio, internet, satellite, and television communications. Envoys from 193 member states selected Bogdan Martin over her Russian lone rival. Members met in Romania, and over 70% voted for her. She's the first American to hold the post since the 60s. The vote ended a contest that was largely overshadowed by geopolitics in the wake of Russia's war in Ukraine. Mobile phones may go dark in Europe this winter. That's due to an energy crisis that might affect much of the cellular network across the continent. The reduction of Russian gas supplies to Europe because of the Ukraine conflict might lead to power cuts. Industry executives reportedly fear that a harsh winter would seriously put their infrastructure under stress. They say there are currently not enough backup systems across the continent to handle widespread power shortages, which will likely lead to mobile phone outages. States across the EU are planning on how to keep telecommunications running in case of outages, and European phone manufacturers Nokia and Ericsson say they're working with mobile network operators on how to handle the impact of potential power shortages. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And still to come, in France, thousands of protesters took to the streets to protest against low salaries as inflation continues to rise in the country. And Bavaria produces beer, mineral water, and soda, but one thing is urgently needed for production, carbon dioxide, and CO2 is in short supply. Stay tuned for more on that when we return. been invaded. By whom? The same ideology that's attacking our state, Marxism. Hi, my name is Lucas Miles. I'm an ordained minister and best-selling author. The Bible says that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Over the past decade, I've traveled around the world from Nairobi to DC, Los Angeles to Kuala Lumpur, sharing the gospel with anyone who would listen. As a young pastor, I was wooed by Christian socialism and its so-called utopian ideals. But I soon realized that its ideas are unbiblical and its progressive policies are destructive. As socialists, we know the answer is class 
struggle. Now, I'm tirelessly exposing the dangers of Marxist ideology in the church and unveiling the truth about the agenda of the last. Some of this is going to be difficult to watch. I just want to warn you up front about that. Throwing it literally in human feces, this is a hate crime. He said God acted like an older white man with absolute power. He's abandoned God. They want a church that bows down to the state. They want a church that worships the state. He goes, I realize that if I don't start getting political, that I'm not going to be able to be spiritual. So if you want to stay informed on the most critical issues regarding religious freedom and the Christian faith, then you've come to the right place. This is Church and State. Good to have you back with us. Annual inflation in the European Union is expected to be 10% in September, up from 9.1% in August, according to a flash estimate from Eurostat, the European Union's statistics office. Official data released by Eurostat on Friday showed that energy was the main component of inflation. Eurostat also said in its estimate that energy is expected to have the highest annual rate in September. Energy prices are expected to be up by 40.8% in September, up from 38.6% in August. In France, over 10,000 workers walked off their jobs and protested in the streets Thursday, calling for wages to rise. Many said they fear the pressure on prices will only worsen this winter. Entities France correspondent David Vives spoke to some of the protesters. France has so far managed to keep inflation lower than in most other EU countries. But the increase in prices is finally catching with French groceries. According to information services company Nielsen IQ, food prices in September rose to 7.6%, up from 6.6% in August. Nielsen predicts inflation could rise to 10% in December. More than 10,000 of workers walked off their jobs on Thursday and marched in the streets following the concerted call from some unions. Union leader Philippe Martinez is calling for company bosses to raise wages. For the moment, nothing is changing and the problems are getting worse. The end of the month is increasingly difficult for many households in France. That's what we have to solve. According to a recent survey by Nielsen IQ, 12 million French households say the rise of prices is very concerning for them. Some of people at the protest said they feel the impact of inflation, but worry it's going to get worse. It affects me quite a bit, because I don't have a big pension. Inflation is something I was dreading. It's here now. We'll see what it's going to be like at the end of the year. I've been retired for a year. My pension has gone up 4%. Inflation is at 7%. It's going up every day. But I really think that the worst is yet to come. The government has been throwing out vouchers to people. But we are going to end up in situations where it's not going to be enough. People won't be able to get by, and there will be a lot more people on the street. Of course, we feel the inflation's impact on prices, more or less depending on your income, but it really feels like a threat to the whole society. As for me, I'm fine for now, but for how long? French consumers are now purchasing less meat, fish and cheese. Overall consumption has decreased by 1.7%. We are forced to make choices, be it about what we buy or the consumption of electricity, the heating, the gas for this winter. And some question the French government's claim that the Ukraine war has caused the soaring inflation. I don't understand what's happening. We are sold a fairy tale. 
We are told that it's the cost of the war with Russia, for example, electricity. We have nuclear power plants that do not work. They could be repaired, but they blame the French and make them pay more for electricity. More protests and strikes are planned this week in France. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Over to Germany, over to Germany where carbon dioxide is in short supply and a lack of CO2 is causing production problems for beer and other fizzy beverages. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details on the shortage. Production is still running at the Schweiger Brewery. Here in Bavaria, they produce beer, mineral water, and soda. But one thing is urgently needed for production, carbon dioxide. Well, we have tried out and improvised a lot now, with nitrogen and with air. We are testing. At the moment, it's all at the experimental stage. But we think that in the future, we'll be able to replace some CO2 with nitrogen or air. Oxygen is a big enemy for beer. Before bottles are filled, they must be preloaded with carbon dioxide so that the oxygen is displaced. Then the beer can flow into the bottle. More urgently, carbonic acid is needed for lemonades and mineral water. Carbonic acid is a compound made from CO2. Beer is actually the least endangered of all products because the carbonic acid in beer is natural carbonic acid. It is produced during fermentation. I only need a little CO2 to fill the beer into the bottle. With soft drinks, lemonades, mineral water, the situation is different. We add the carbonic acid that is in there with artificial carbonic acid. CO2 is produced as a byproduct of fertilizer ammonia. Now it's in short supply because less fertilizer is being produced in Germany due to high energy prices. It's causing many current product shortages. The managing director of the Bavarian Brewers Association sees a solution to the problem. One solution to ensure that there is enough carbonic acid again, and it affects not only the brewing industry but also other food producers, would be for fertilizer production in Germany to start up again with subsidized energy. The supply chain connected to fertilizer production is not only about CO2, but also about hydrochloric acid. And a CO2 shortage is just one of many issues. We have procurement problems. Raw material prices have exploded insanely with the Ukraine war. It's a tough time. The pandemic was a piece of cake comparatively. The latest delivery of CO2 will only last a week at the brewery. After that, Schweiger may have to think about which of his products to discontinue. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Inflation is hitting home in Spain as well. An annual survey finds the price of a basket of baked goods is up 15% since last year. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details on how Spaniards are coping. Venezuelan Daniela Cesario arrived in Spain nine months ago with her husband and baby. Back then, about $100 was enough for a supermarket run. Now, as food prices soar, she has to resort to a food bank in Madrid. The increase in food prices has been very high. It's been considerable and evident. It's been cents, but it has been rising sharply. It has been coming to this neighborhood association for three months now, and it has helped us a lot. Since we have been coming here, we have not bought any more vegetables, fruit or milk, and they even help us with milk for the baby. Hundreds of others line up at food banks across Spain, but the charities are also struggling to stock up as donations dwindle. Donors no longer have surplus food to give away. We no longer have oil. We used to have a family that brought us 150 liters of oil every week, which meant that we could provide oil to various groups every week, but that has stopped. Milk. We used to have milk donations. Before they gave us a six pack, and now they give us one liter. That means everyone is quite limited. Spain's main consumer organization annually surveys the price of a basket of basic goods in 80 supermarkets around the country. This year, they found an average increase of 15%. Now, they're calling on the government to suspend taxes on basic foods. They say the measure would help low-income families hit by the sharp rise in supermarket prices. According to the National Statistics Institute, Annual food price inflation hit just shy of 14% in August. My monthly income is not enough. My wife doesn't have a stable job either, so logically I have to ask for help because it's not enough. 
With 1,000 euros, you can't make ends meet having two children. You can't. Inflation in Spain fell from 10.5% in August to 9% in September. Core inflation was at 6.2% year on year, down from 6.4% in August. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Just ahead, Australia's Prime Minister announces an end to isolation requirements for people with COVID-19. It was one of the country's last pandemic restrictions. Details to come on NTD News Today. Australia will end its mandatory five-day home quarantine for COVID-infected people on October 14th. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese announced the news today. We have agreed uh, today that we will end, uh, states and territories will end their respective mandatory isolation requirements on the 14th of October. It recognises that we are in a very low transmission, community transmission uh, phase of the pandemic here in Australia. It's time to move away from COVID exceptionalism in my view. The move, letting those who are infected choose if they want to quarantine or not, removes one of Australia's last remaining restrictions from the pandemic area. Nearly 97% of Australians 16 or older have had at least two coronavirus vaccine shots. Once a champion of COVID suppression, Australia has shifted away from its fortress-style controls and began living with the virus since early this year. The government will also axe pandemic leave payments for casual workers by mid-October. The Prime Minister says it isn't suitable for government to pay people's wages forever. A polyphenol coming from the mists of time can reduce inflation and act against neurodegenerative conditions. If only we knew where to find it. Here's Gina Marie who brings us Strong Mind and Body. Polyphenol found in grapes and berries is causing a real buzz in research circles and well-publicized studies. The results are in. The cardiovascular system benefits from a resveratrol-rich diet. Add to that antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-aging and anti-cancer factors and this is pretty exciting. But wait, there's more. In a study published in the Journal of Neuroinflammation, scientists say resveratrol could protect brain cells in an unexpected way. It stimulates the destruction of specific proteins. Let's unravel the science behind it. Resveratrol acts as a natural antibiotic that protects plants from fungal infections, blight and ultraviolet radiation. Now scientists want to repeat that benefit in humans. They have discovered that resveratrol supplementation reduces cognitive and functional decline in Alzheimer's patients. Early research supports this with resveratrol demonstrating its neuroprotection against Huntington's and Parkinson's diseases too. So where are the natural sources of resveratrol? Eat how the amounts of grapes, blueberries and pomegranates. Some believe red grape skins have more resveratrol than the green ones. However, that depends on growing conditions. While red wine made from grape skins contains resveratrol, health experts say alcohol increases the risk of several common cancers, so you'll want to limit your intake of red wine. Grapes and berries are a safe, non-alcoholic source of resveratrol. You can supplement with resveratrol, but consult your integrative medical doctor to determine the safe amount. Meanwhile, you can enjoy grapes and berries in moderation. NASA and SpaceX are planning to study boosting the nearly 33-year-old Hubble Space Telescope to a higher orbit in a bid to extend its life. The company and the space agency sign an agreement to investigate the benefits and risks of a private mission to service Hubble. SpaceX approached NASA a few months ago with the idea. It isn't yet certain whether or not that mission could be carried out. The agreement is just to explore the technical feasibility of the idea and won't involve any exchange of funds. Singer and musician Lizzo added something special to the Washington, D.C. stop of her tour, playing a bit of history. This is video of the accomplished singer and flutist playing an approximately 200-year-old crystal flute at the Library of Congress. French flute maker Claude Laurent gifted the delicate woodwind to former President James Madison in 1813. 
The Library of Congress kept the flute in its vault for decades before allowing Lizzo to play it, both on site and later on stage at her concert. Lizzo said playing the crystal instrument was like playing out of a wine glass. The Oregon Zoo is celebrating autumn with its animals. The zoo recently shared this video on social media. It shows red pandas, rhinos, bears, and more having a ball eating and playing with pumpkins and squash. While the otters take delicate bites, an elephant smashes into the treat with his foot. Lemurs dig out the tasty innards, and a polar bear rolls the pumpkin around like a ball. It seems everyone is getting in on the fun, even an alligator. The zoo workers dropped off fall's favorite food at several of the habitats in the zoo. It's just another sign that the cooler season is here and can be enjoyed by every creature. Who would have known zoo animals like jack-o'-lanterns too? And that's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.